Both clubs needed nothing short of a revolution to drag them into the modern age of football. Sectarianism was at its height, and on the pitch the two teams that had dominated Europe a decade earlier now couldn't even dominate the Scottish League. Going against their traditionally conservative image, it was Rangers that were first to try and stop the rot. They appointed their first manager from outside the Rangers family and brought in new players, predominantly from England, but the players themselves didn't fully realise the history they were dealing with. My children were um, Catholics, my wife was a Catholic at the time, and um, my supporters were singing songs about killing Catholics, and the opposition were singing songs about killing Protestants and their glorifying murderers. Now, okay, that's, as I said, that's something that never sat comfortable with me. I just come from Italy and France, where I was playing with a team of Catholics, and thoroughly enjoyed their company, lovely people, very warm people, and then all of a sudden I'm thrust into this, Milan, uh, this Glasgow derby, where the religious aspect of it was, was very much to the fore, which I hated. I had uh, only one child at a time, and uh, even at school she would like, you know, you'd go and pick her up, and you could see the mums and, and dads sort of talking about you behind it, and, oh, that's his daughter, you know, the Protestant being. And it's a total culture shock. We were brought up with it, and we still never used to, to come from England into this arena where you're talking, it's, it's really vile stuff. You know, I got burgled twice while I was up, living up there, um, and they found a lad, and he was a, he was a Celtic supporter. For Souness and the English, it was join in or get out. And in his own inimitable style, Souness encouraged them to join in. Englishmen like Graham Roberts and Terry Butcher soon followed his lead. And besides a spate of red cards, they did begin to win over the fans and challenge for league championships. Terry Butcher became a Scotsman overnight and the supporters loved his up and atom style. And he, in, in playing terms at that time, was, was the main man. He was the most influential figure, an Englishman, leading the revolution. After leading Rangers to their first title for nine years, the Englishmen were considered full-blooded Protestants. But they were accused of becoming too involved in the rivalry the following season. It stays up in support for Celtic. There's Morris. Phillips at full stretch, and the fullback did well. An angry exchange there between McAvenny and Woods, and here's trouble now. And this is what everyone was hoping would not arise. Drama here. When Englishman Chris Woods was sent off with Celtic's Frank McAvenny, Graham Roberts took over as goalkeeper. Here's Walker. That's for Peter Grant. That's the second. Celtic went ahead. Then, in an increasingly tense atmosphere, Rangers equalised. Such was the sense of relief for the Rangers team that Roberts thought he'd conduct the crowd in a song they were singing, not realising it was about William of Orange and killing Catholics. It's just another song. It's, it's sort of... I never knew the background of it all. It was getting louder and louder. And there was like 40,000, 45,000 Rangers supporters uh, singing. You know, they were, we, we were 2 0 down, and all of a sudden we became 2 2. I don't think the guys actually realised how that is a knife in somebody's heart or somebody's back. It's, it's, some people really find that so nauseating, and they, they pay the penalty for it. Police in Scotland have charged three international footballers with conduct likely to cause a breach of the peace. The three are Chris Woods and Graham Roberts, both of Rangers and England, and Frank McAvenny of Celtic and Scotland. We got a phone call on the Sunday morning. Could we go to the police station and uh, we, we asked what for? And they said it was uh, because we were being charged with uh, trying to start a riot. People found it very hard to come to terms with the power and the passion that was attached to Rangers and people were interfering into things that, that they shouldn't have procurator fiscal getting themselves involved in a football match. I'm sure he's embarrassed if he looks back now because he had no right, he had no place, he didn't warrant it and um, you know football can manage its own business. When Celtic snatched back the championship in Sunes's second year 
he made the decision to break another Rangers taboo. The English players had now been accepted, but what he considered doing threatened to alienate the whole club from their core support. Bucking a century of tradition, Souness was considering buying a Roman Catholic. I think every Rangers manager before me had been asked the question, would you sign a Catholic? And I, when I was asked that question, and I think it happened within the first week of my being there, um, I was asked the question, would you sign a, 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 a Catholic for Glasgow Rangers? I said, I certainly would. I said, how can I go home every night and have dinner with my, my children are, are Catholics? So I said, you know, you asked me a question. I come to work and I'm a bigot, and then when I go home I'm, I want to be a normal person. I said, no. I said, if, if there's a good one comes along, I feel it's right for this club, we'll do it. And a lot of people at the time said, oh, that's the standard, you know, standard answer for every manager who's been asked that. I said, well, no, that's, that's a fact. If there's a good one comes along, um, we will do it. We had a monkey on our back, so to speak, as a club, and both Graham and I discussed it at great length, and uh, we felt it was very necessary if we were seen to, to be accepted in a wider marketplace. When it was considered that Rangers might sign the first Catholic player in their history, it was thought that to appease the fans, they should probably not choose a Glasgow Catholic. Johnston with a header! More Johnston this time! It should also definitely not be a Catholic who played for Celtic. And it should certainly not be a Celtic Glasgow Catholic who in 1986 had butted a Rangers player and made the sign of the cross at Ibrox as he was sent off. If you'd have said to any Rangers fan, who's, who's the worst Catholic you would want to sign, it would be Morris Johnston. But then surely it couldn't be Mo Johnston, as he had just returned from France, re-signed for Celtic, and pledged his lifelong allegiance to the club. I finished my career here, I don't want to play for anybody else, so I don't want any speculation about me going anywhere else. I just want to play for Celtic, and that's, that's fine. Celtic had paraded Morris as a future signing, they'd made him wear a Celtic strip, he was playing in France at the time. They'd got him back, they pushed him in front of cameras, which he didn't want to do, and made him wear a Celtic strip, and he was going to be a future signing. And uh, I asked his agent if he had actually signed, he said no. I said, would he come here? He said, I think he would. Within days of his appearance at Celtic, Mo Johnston appeared at another press conference, this time at Rangers. Flashed on the TV screen, Morris Johnson signs for Rangers, and there was just silence, complete silence. They might have put up "War has broken out." There was just complete, deathly silence. No one could believe it. They thought it was a hoax. People in the cafe seriously thought that this was a hoax. It was so unthinkable, uh, but it happened. Um, and right away, of course, you know, throughout the city, you saw this graffiti going up, you know, stuff about uh, Mojo, you traitor. And I remember there was one um, uh, at Belgrove Station in Glasgow that just says, collaborators will be kneecapped, Mojo. Ironically, the signing of Johnston was one of the few things in the history of the old firm that brought a unified response from both sets of fans. They both hated him. Traitor. Scumbag. I mean, words don't describe me. I, I wouldn't call myself a violent person, but really, that is the kind of person that makes your blood boil. I was actually sitting in a hotel in Belfast on the 11th of July. Um, I was over there for the orange walk, and so it came from a bit of a shock that they signed Mo Johnson. Yeah, that, that, that was a shocker. And I just bought my season ticket, and that season ticket is still lying in there, brand new, without a leaf taken out of it today. I've kept it as a wee souvenir, and uh, I didn't go back. I know Graham's been applauded um, in many sources by saying that this was the, the breaking down of the, the sectarian divide. I don't think it was. I just think Graham saw the opportunity to put a real big one over Celtic, and I think he took the opportunity. And it goes to Johnston. That's a corner. It's a rough and tumble business, and I make no secret of it. We were in the business of being number one, and if we can get any advantage at all over Celtic, who are and always will be Rangers' biggest rivals, we must, you know, at the time we had to take it. Now I saw us poaching, us signing Morris Johnson, whatever you want to call it, is dealing them an almighty blow, an almighty blow, and I think I was correct.